why in the world do you want to do business with the federal government? Go through all the red tape, jump through all the hoops to, you know, to, you know, to get into this. Okay, larger amounts of work. That's the standard answer I get. It comes back to revenue. You want to get more revenue coming in. That, that's why most companies do this. Most companies don't understand this process. When you look at the federal market overall, look at all the small businesses that are in the United States, and depending on who you talk to, the, the number that we use at the SBA is there's about 27 million small businesses in the United States. There's somewhere between one and one and a half percent of those small businesses that are even signed up to do business with the federal government. Not a lot of companies, but there's a lot of opportunity because the federal government spends round numbers $500 billion a year buying products and services. Within that $500 billion, every federal agency has goals that they're supposed to at least try to meet in awarding some of those dollars to small businesses. 23% is supposed to go to small business. 5%, within that 23%, 5% to women-owned small business, 5% to small disadvantaged business, 3% to hubs-owned small business, and 3% to service-disabled veteran-owned small business. You look at some of those numbers, and there's a lot of dollars out there. <coughs> Round numbers, $100 billion a year going to small business. You know, and then you can break down the, the individual percentages uh, beyond that. There's opportunity out there and not a lot of companies going after that opportunity. But it's a matter of understanding the process and that's what this class is really designed to do is outline for you the process to pursue federal contracts. So what do we mean by a small business? What's a small business? Trying to get you to talk. That's actually for state contracts. That's at the state level. Federal looks at it a little differently. At the federal level, it depends on what you do. It depends on uh, we call we base it on what we call your NAICS code, the North American Industrial Classification System. All that system does is define industries. And for each industry, what the SBA has done is defined what is a small business, what is not a small business. There's one line that's drawn in the sand for each industry. If you're a manufacturing company, it's based on number of employees. 500 employees or fewer is a small business. If you've averaged 500 employees or less for the last, uh, over the last 12 months. Wholesalers and distributors, it's 100 employees. When you get into services and construction, it's based on revenues and it's your average revenue per year for the last three years. The smallest size standard for that is uh, currently $7 million, and it goes all the way up to 34 and a half, depending on just what it is that you do. One of the documents in your package is the table of size standards that the SBA puts together. Uh, I didn't uh, bring those for this. I apologize. Um, I do have that. You can actually download that at sba.gov size. I apologize, I'm actually teaching a longer version of this class later this week, and that's the one that I put the, the table of size standards into. So my apologies for that. So any questions on any of that? SBA.gov slash size. Size, S-I-Z-E. see here. Now I'll just do it the old-fashioned way. First thing you need to do business with the federal government is get a Dunn's number. The Dunn system is administered by Dunn and Bradstreet. 
if you go directly to Dun & Bradstreet through this website, you're going to be paying them a fee, usually between two and five hundred dollars, to be able to get the Dun's number and then a package of services that goes along with it. Those services pretty much is a credit report on your company. Some businesses love getting that credit report. You know, it's a very valuable business tool to them. They want to know how their customers are seeing them and the, their credit worthiness. It's not something that is required for federal contracting. Federal contracting officers do not use those credit reports. So remember that, depending on why you want the Dunn's number. But you still need to be registered with Dunn and Bradstreet because the federal government does not want to uh, work with really fly-by-night companies. You know, we want to work with companies that are established to, to some degree where you know, we know that you, are, that, you, um, that you are a legitimate business enterprise. You know, it's your taxpayer dollars that are going to, to pay these contracts. You, know, you don't want your taxpayer dollars going to a company that is just going to take that money and run. So you know, we require the, the registration with Dun & Bradstreet. If you go directly to Dun & Bradstreet, you can use this website, you're going to pay the fee. If you don't want to pay the fee, if you're only looking to get the Dunn's number to do business with the federal government, go to SAM.gov. SAM is a required registration for anyone that is doing business with the federal government. Through the SAM system, you're going to put in, uh, you can request the Dunn's number from there, but you're going to put in some just basic company information. Address, phone number, email address, website, you know, all the, the real basic stuff. You're going to put in points of contact within your company. Who's the government business point of contact? Electronic commerce point of contact, if you, you know, and it can be you. You can be the point of contact for every section. Um, but you're going to put in different points of contact. You're going to put in your NAICS codes. This is what my company does. You're going to put in your number of employees. You're going to put in your revenues. And the system will calculate for each one of your NAICS codes, are you a small business or not? That's how you self-certify as a small business for federal, for federal contracting. And we'll talk about the self-certifications in a few minutes. Uh, you're also going to put your banking information into the SAM system. Because when it comes time to be paid, contracting officer is going to take uh, what is called your CAGE code. That's a five-digit unique identifier that is assigned to you when you're done your SAM registration. They take your CAGE code, put it into their payment system. Their payment system interfaces with SAM, direct deposits of the funds into your bank account. Really great process. How many of you, you know, we just had tax day a couple of weeks ago. How many of you filed your taxes electronically? You're getting a refund and you put the, you know, your banking information in there, IRS puts it right into your bank account. Same process. Funds go directly into your, uh, into your bank account and for most companies, they get paid between 10 and 14 days, if that's what happens. You don't have to wait you know, 30 days or 60 days or 90 days to get paid. So it can really streamline the process. When you're done with the basic SAM uh, registration, there's a, a module in there that's called Small Business. That takes you to a part of the SAM site that the SBA oversees. We don't oversee the main SAM site. Uh, that is for every business, large and small. Um, that's actually overseen by the, the General Services Administration, federal agency. Uh, but we do oversee, we call it uh, the dynamic small business search. Um, it sometimes uh, might be called your SBA profile. Within that, you can put in some additional information about your company. You can put in keywords. You know, so that when someone is searching, what makes you different? How are you separated from your competitors? As we were doing the introductions early on, you know, uh, that was one of the things that I didn't hear a lot of. You know, you described your business, this is what you did, but what makes you different from your competitors? What can set you apart? You can put in a capabilities narrative, and that would be, I would say, a must. If you're going to do anything in your SBA profile, put in a capabilities narrative. It's a few sentences, describes your company, again, going back to that elevator pitch, just describes who you are, what you do, what sets you apart. When someone does a search in the dynamic small business search, looking for small businesses, and federal agencies do it, large businesses do it, when they're looking for small business partners. Uh, there are four fields that come up. The company name, company address, point of contact, and the capabilities narrative. 
If you don't have the capabilities narrative filled out, guess what's going to happen? Someone does a search, your profile may be there, but if your competitors have their capabilities narrative filled out, that's who they're going to look at first. And they may skip over you completely if you don't have it filled out. And the other part of the small business profile that you can, uh, the SBA profile that you can fill in is references. Contracting officers at the federal level, they want to know that you can get the job done. That is their absolute number one priority. Can you do the job for them? Whether the contract is for $10,000, whether the contract is for $10 million. You know, their number one priority is can you get the job done? They want to be able to see some of those references. It can be, they don't have to be government references, but they want to see that you've done the work before somewhere. Any questions on that? SAM is a new system. It was just kicked off uh, the end of last summer. There's still a lot of bugs in the system, unfortunately. So that there may, you know, as you're going through the process, there may be some glitches in there. Uh, but um, the, the SAM system, it is designed to replace both the central contractor registration database as well as online representations and certifications, ORCA. Um, we talk a lot in acronyms at the in the federal government. Um, so if I say something you don't understand, let me know. Um, but uh, SAM does replace both CCR and ORCA. Those sites do not exist anymore. If you try typing in CCR.gov, it will give you all kinds of error messages. If you had information in CCR and ORCA, that was automatically ported over into SAM. So you don't need to, re to start over from scratch, recreate the wheel. All of that information was carried over. So you do need to, to update your SAM profile at least once a year. The system will send you an email to, to remind you of that. One of the nice things about the references in the, the small business section is that hopefully you're getting new references on a regular basis. If you're going in to, to update that information, you can just do a quick run through, make sure that, you're, that everything is correct, update the information as you're going through so that way it's not this you know, just one time a year thing that you're going in just because the system says it's time to go in and update. So eventually some of the other sites that we're going to talk about here today will be included in SAM as well. FedBizOps, the Federal Procurement Data System, uh, some of these other uh, sites that we're going to talk about will be included as part of the SAM portal. It's being designed as a one-stop shop. You have one username, one password, gets you into the system so you don't need to worry about anything else. So any other questions on the, the registration? Yes. So you're basically saying that the gun and the SAM are pretty much the same thing, but the gun has a charge and the SAM does not. DUNS does not have a charge. If you go to SAM.gov first, you can request the DUNS number through that site and you get it free of charge. If you go directly to Dun and Bradstreet to get the Dun's number, um, that, that's when you're going to pay the fee and you're going to get the Dun's number plus a whole bunch of other services that they're going to offer. So now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. So, um, one thing with the, the Dunn's number, if you get the Dunn's number for free, keep in mind Dunn and Bradstreet is a commercial company. They have a contract with the federal government to provide the Dunn's numbers for free. However, as a commercial company, they will likely be calling you to try to upsell you to buy this package of services. And guess how much those services cost? Between two and five hundred dollars. Same thing as if you went to them directly. From what businesses tell me, they do put a hard sell on you. You do not need to buy those services. You know, and I'm, you know, I, I try to emphasize that. You know, there are some companies that have come to me and said that you know, they make it sound like this is absolutely imperative. 
It's not a requirement. You don't have to buy those services if you, know, if you just need the DUNS number to do business with the federal government. You do not need to buy those services. Federal contracting officers do not use the, the Dun and Bradstreet reports. You know, uh, that's just, you know, I've never talked to a contracting officer that has requested one. So you can, um, you know, if you want to buy the services, as I said, there are some companies that, that, that get a lot of value out of it. But if it's not something that you feel you need, you don't have to buy them. So as you're going through the process, um, you self-certify as a small business, and I've already talked about that. When you put in your NAICS codes, your revenues, and your number of employees. You would also self-certify as a woman-owned business, veteran-owned, service-disabled veteran-owned, and small disadvantaged business. For those last four, so long as the company is at least 51% owned and controlled by an individual that's uh, part of one of those groups, then you qualify as, you could qualify as, uh, you know, um, as whichever group it is. Um, ownership, relatively straightforward. For control, we're looking for three things. You have to hold the highest title in the company. You have to manage the day-to-day -day operations of the company. And you need to make the long-term decisions for the company. Those are the three primary areas that we're looking at for control. For small disadvantaged business, uh, the company needs to be at least 51% owned and controlled by an individual who is both socially and economically disadvantaged. Social disadvantage, the, the way that I define that, it's an individual who has been stereotyped. And because of the stereotype, they face discrimination. There are five ethnic groups that are presumed to be socially disadvantaged. African American, Native American, Hispanic American, Asian Pacific American, and subcontinent Asian American are presumed to be socially disadvantaged. But because the definition is broader than that, it's anyone who has faced a stereotype, and because of that face discrimination, then the, if you can demonstrate that discrimination, then you may be considered socially disadvantaged. For economic disadvantage, we're looking at the personal net worth of that dis, uh, socially disadvantaged individual. So that uh, from your net worth, we subtract equity in your primary residence, equity in the business, and funds that have been invested into a legitimate retirement account. Once we make the subtractions, it, for small disadvantaged business, if the economic, uh, if your adjusted net worth is 750,000 or below, you're economically disadvantaged for the small disadvantaged business program. The 8A program down here is a sister program to small disadvantaged business. Socially disadvantaged, described, uh, defined exactly the same way. Economic disadvantage for the 8A program is 250,000 or below adjusted net worth. The 8A program is also a nine-year program. It is the only small business program that has a time limit to it because it is a business development program. That's actually where I spend the majority of my time. I work with companies in that program, helping them to grow and develop um, through federal contracting. Um, and because it's a business development program, by the time you get through all nine years, hopefully there's an understanding of how to grow and develop, how to use federal contracting, how to be able to pursue those contracts on your own so that you don't need the assistance of the program. So, but the biggest benefit of the 8A program are sole source contracts, where you're not competing on price with anyone for those opportunities. The agency, in essence, selects your company because they believe you can get the job done. They offer that project to the SBA on your behalf if everything is in order and we accept that, pro that requirement into the program on, on your behalf you can negotiate the contract directly with the agency. You're the only company that's submitting a bid. You don't need to worry about anyone else and what, you know, that you have to come in at a lower price or a better value or anything else. Um, you know, that's a, a big benefit. But you are competing on the marketing front because those opportunities are not advertised. You're not going to see them in FedBizOps or on any other agency website. You ha it's about relationships, getting out, meeting the the, uh, the decision makers within those agencies so that you can be eligible for those opportunities. They have to know who you are and what you can do. Then the HUBZone program, historically underutilized business zones. Um, those are areas typically of high unemployment and low income. 
Um, and if the company is located in one of those areas and at least 35% of the company employees live in one of those areas, then the company may be eligible for that certification. Um, and the primary benefit there is uh, that there are some contracts that are set aside for only HUBZone companies to submit bids. So the 8A program and the HUBZone program are formal certifications where you need to submit an application to the SBA in order to, to be certified there. The others are self-certifications that you go through the, uh, the SAM registration process, you check off the boxes that, um, that, you, uh, you know, that you are certifying that you meet the eligibility criteria for those programs. Um, and then if there's any uh, challenge to your status, that comes to the SBA um, and we make the decision based on that. So that's when we're going to come to you and say, we need this information, can you provide it? We'll review everything and make the, the determination. So questions on the certifications? Mm -hmm. You can it, you can have as many certifications th as you're eligible for. Like the right, even with the formal certifications. Now, would it benefit someone to, to fill out say, three of those and the software there, the self certification? Um, it, it so long as you're eligible, uh, absolutely. Um, does it give you more of an added benefit, or does it not matter? It's more avenues for a contracting officer to work with you once they decide that that you can get the job done for them because there are small business set-asides, there are women-owned small business set-asides, there are service-disabled veteran-owned small business set-asides. So, you know, that, that would be three avenues de depending on the, the level of competition, who else is out there, um, but it's three ways that, you know, if, if those were the three, um, uh, and the, the Department of Veterans Affairs has veteran-owned set-asides. So if you're looking to do business with the VA, that would be a, another way that they could work with you depending on the, uh, who else was out there. Because if they knew that there was, you know, and I'll use women-owned just as the example uh, with that set-aside, that's actually our newest set-aside program. Set-aside. Set-aside. What that means is that the, when the contracting officer puts the solicitation out, it is reserved only for companies that have that certification. That's what set-aside means. It's going to be competed only among companies with that certification. It limits the competition for you, limits the competition for the contracting officer. You know, so that, um, let's say that they had a requirement. You know, they were buying whatever it is. Um, you know, let's say that they were buying these tables. Um, and if they put it out as full and open competition, they may get 100 bids. That they have to go through all 100 bids. If they do it as a small business set aside, maybe they only get 20 bids. If they can do it as a woman-owned small business set aside because they know that there are at least two women-owned businesses out there that are uh, eligible and willing to submit bids for that particular opportunity, they need to know that there's at least two, then they can put it out as a woman-owned small business set aside. And by doing that, instead of getting 20 that they might get with a small business, maybe they're only getting eight. Correct. So, but again, this is where the relationships come into play because those are decisions are made before the solicitation is ever released to the public. So they need to know who you are and what you can do before, as, you know, just as they're going through the whole planning process, they need to know who you are and what you can do so that they can make the decision, okay, which program do we want to use? You know, because if, you know, um, if you're a woman-owned business, and if they only know that there's one other woman-owned business out there that, is, that can do the work, even though you might be perfectly able to do it, you might, be, you, know, you might be a great fit for that project. If they only know of one other company, you know, or know of one company and it's not yours, they can't use that program. You have to be out there talking to the, the agencies in order for them to, to really utilize these programs. Yes. So, um, and I can certainly, you know, get you, uh, get you more information. Um, there is a section on the website for the, in particular for the 8A Business Development Program, small disadvantaged business because it's a self-certification. Uh, I don't know that we have a separate section for it right now. 
um, but I can certainly get you that, that information if you need it. So my contact information is on the first slide. Um, feel free, you know, call me, email me, you know, um, whatever you need. So any other questions on the certifications? These are the actual numbers. Um, the government's fiscal year runs October 1st through September 30th. Important dates to know because that's usually what the spending cycle is. We don't have fiscal year 12 data yet because the Department of Defense has a lag time to report their data for security purposes. So even though fiscal year 12 ended on September 30th last year, um, by the time DOD reported everything, we're actually in the process of cleansing all that data before we release it. Um, so I should be, usually that was released sometime late spring, early summer. Um, it just hasn't been released yet. So these are the last four complete fiscal years that we have. You have the goals along the top that I talked about earlier, 23, 5, 5, 3, and 3. And then these are the actual numbers. Small business, we hit on occasion, not very regularly. Women-owned business, we've never hit. The Women-Owned Small Business Set-Aside Program is only a couple of years old right now. Um, it's our newest program. And we're hoping that as the fiscal year 12 numbers come in and, and forward that we're going to see more of an uptick. But because it was released, that program started really in the middle of fiscal year 11, the plans were already made. Agencies already had their budgets. They knew how they were going to spend. They really weren't using that program. Small disadvantaged business is the, the one goal that is met on a regular basis because of the 8A program. You know, because they're sister programs and the, the sole source 8A contracts you know, can be a, a very easy way for contracting officers to award contracts. So that goal is regularly met. Service disabled vet has never been met. Hub zone has never been met. I don't really understand what those percentages mean. What is Within the federal government, um, the, the agencies have goals to award a certain percentage of their prime contract dollars to these different small business categories. 23% to small business, 5% to women owned, 5% to small disadvantaged business. That these were not met. That these are the, the actual percentages. It was supposed 23% is what they are supposed to award. So if, if an agency, fictional agency, has a budget of $100 million, $23 million uh, are supposed to go to small businesses through, you know, through the contracts. Okay, and then below it's showing what right, the, the actuals. Right. So 21, in fiscal year 11, 21.65% went to small business. Didn't hit the goal, but it was still $91.5 billion that went to small businesses. And keep in mind, there's only between 1% and 1.5% of all small businesses in the United States that are even registered in the SAM system to pursue these contracts. So, you know, the, there's, there aren't that many companies that are taking advantage of all these dollars that are out there. Mostly because they don't understand the process. That's, you know, that they think that it's too complicated, too cumbersome. Um, they don't want to put the, the time and effort in to pursue the opportunities um, because it is more complicated to pursue federal contracts than commercial work. You know, for a lot of commercial work, um, you know, when, you, uh, when you're out developing relationships, usually there's just one decision maker. You know, for a lot of companies, unless you get into the really big corporations, there might be multiple. But, you know, for your companies, for the most part, you make the decisions. You know, what, what vendor are we going to use for this, that, the other thing? Um, you know, you make that decision and then the, you know, you just, you, and you make that decision on whatever criteria you want. At the federal level, there are multiple decision makers for every contract. There's usually four different decision makers that you need to reach out to. Um, there's the, uh, the small business specialist, and we'll talk about all this as we get into the marketing as well. Small business specialist, they're part of the planning process. You need to reach out to the program managers. They're representing the end users, the people that need the products and services that you're selling. There's the contracting staff. They're the ones putting all the paperwork together. And then whoever controls the budget. So because you're talking about multiple layers of people that you need to reach out to, you know, it's more time and effort to pursue these opportunities. 
And there's a lot of companies that just feel it's not worth that time and effort. For the companies that get in, yes, because the contracts tend to be uh, a little bit longer term. Um, and so it's steadier revenue coming in for the, you know, the, the longer haul. So, but it, you know, it takes time and effort to get that first contract. And then once you have your first contract, then after that, it should be easier mm -hmm. to continue on to get respond. Right. You had a question? Yes, because you know, even though your information is in SAM and, and they can look you up, they don't know if you can get the job done for them or not. You know, that they want to be able to, they, you know, they really need to be able to know that you can get the job done. If they award you a contract, and that's, you know, the, there are a lot of companies that I've worked with that, you know, um, and I've heard even people say, if you have all the certifications, the contracting officers are looking for you. That's not really true. You can have all the certifications, but if they don't know you can get the job done, if they award you a contract just because you have the certifications and you don't get that job done, guess what? They lose all the credit. You lose the contract, you lose the revenue because you're not getting the job done. They lose all the credit towards the goals because they had to take that contract away from you. And they have to find someone else to get that job done because that agency still needs those products and services. Getting the job done is the number one priority over any certification. And it doesn't matter what you have in, the, you know, in your SAM profile, in your SBA profile. I mean, yes, those are required steps to take. But if they don't know who you are and really know that you can get the job done for them, you know, there's a very good chance they're not going to consider you. you know, it's about developing the relationships. We'll, we'll get into that process in a little bit. So let's keep moving on through, uh, through this, and I promise we'll get there. The Federal Acquisition Regulations, the FAR, uh, that's what the contracting officers use to be able to award contracts. This is what their processes are. You don't need to read all 53 parts. I wouldn't recommend it unless you are really, really wide awake in the middle of the night and you need something to help you fall asleep. Um, then you might want to crack it open. But these are the sections that you should at least review because this is what a contracting officer needs to do. And if you know what a contracting officer needs to do and what information they need from you in order to proceed, you can put yourself in a better position. Federal supply schedules or GSA schedules we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Um, but subpart 8.4 is what a contracting officer uses for that. Part 13, simplified acquisitions. Those are contracts between $3,000 and $150,000. Because they are, by federal standards, smaller contracts, contracting officers have more streamlined ways to award those contracts. Instead of going through a full bid and evaluation process, they can award those contracts uh, you know, using just some streamlined methods. And depending on the size and scope, it could just be that they, you know, they send uh, the information out to three companies that they know and say, give me your quote, email me your quote. It could be that simple. Um, and then whoever the low bidder is would win that contract. Um, the, the reason that you want to look at simplified acquisitions is that those contracts should be reserved for small business unless the contracting officer really has a compelling reason not to award it to a small business, it should be going to small business. There are some instances where it may go to, to a company that is not small, but 99% um, of those contracts will be going to small business. Parts 14 and 15 are the contracts that are over 150000 With sealed bids, that's when price is the only factor. The lowest technically responsible bidder is going to win. Part 15 is when price is not the only factor. That's when they're, it's, uh, they're sometimes known as best value contracts. And that's when the contracting officer is going to look at the technical approach, look at the people that are working on the contract. You know, they're they're going to be looking at more than just the price. 
and the, that agency may spend a little bit more if you can give them a better value than the, the company that's spending a little bit less. And then part 19 is all the small business programs. So, and even there you can find the definition of uh, economic disadvantage with $750,000 and $250,000 thresholds. So, questions on any of this? That's a very good segue into our next slide, um, because that's exactly what the federal procurement data system is. Um, the, this is really talking about prime contracting and how to identify those prime contract opportunities. Prime contracts are the opportunities where you have the contract with, that, with the federal agency. It was awarded directly to you. Positive and negative with that. You know, positive, you have a contract. That's a good thing. Positive, you're getting the majority of the revenue. Because in federal contracting, one of the things that is a requirement, there's a, a, a clause that goes into every contract called limitations on subcontracting. It states that the prime contractor has to do at least 50% of the labor dollars on the contract with their own workforce. The exception to that is in construction. Uh, for general contracting construction, it's 15%. Specialty trade construction, it's 25%. But every other industry, you have to do at least 50% of the labor dollars with your own workforce. So because that is a requirement, when you win a contract, you're getting the majority of the revenue off of that contract. And that's the whole reason that we put that clause into the contracts, because we don't want small businesses winning a contract and then subcontracting out the majority of that to a large business. It was put into a small business program so that the small business could benefit. So, um, the downside to being the prime contractor is that you are responsible for the contract. You know, and like I said, if you can only do 80% of the work and you're subcontracting 20% out to, to someone else, to a, to a partner company, you're still responsible for that 20% being done. You, know, you can't point the finger and say, well, I'm doing my part. They're, you know, they're the ones that are falling down on the job. You, know, you have to uh, make sure that everything is being done and the contracting officer will come to you if there's any problems. The, it, who you subcontract to can be to anyone, so long as you're doing at least 50% yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's 50% of the labor dollars. So materials and equipment are subtracted out, um, and we just look at the, the pool of labor dollars, and it has to be with your own workforce, typically defined as W-2. 1099s are uh, considered independent subcontractors, and so although there may be a few exceptions to that, for the most part, we're looking at W-2 employees. But even with that, it doesn't necessarily need to be full-time W-2 employees who you know, have been on your payroll for years and years. You can bring them on as W-2 employees just for the duration of that contract. You know, if it's a three-month contract, you, know, you bring them on just for that project, and then the contract ends, and you know, they're back to a 1099 status. That's something that can work. So, but the federal procurement data system is the system that you really want to start. Um, and this is all historical purchases. Um, and the reason that you want to use this system, it not only tells you who won the contract and how much they're being paid for it, you know, to give you some idea of, uh, of the pricing, but uh, it actually tells you a whole lot of other information. Because you can get down to not only which agencies within the federal government are buying your products and services, because not every agency buys everything. You know, some agencies buy you know, more of one thing than others. Um, so you want to know who is uh, buying the products and services that you're selling, and not only which agencies, but you can get it down to the contracting office within those agencies. Every agency is set up differently. The Department of the Army is very decentralized. You, know, you can go to Toby Hanna Army Depot, and they're going to be buying a lot of the, you know, a lot of what they need on that base, because that's how the army is set up. You know, that contracting office will buy sort of whatever the base needs. You go to the Department of Homeland Security; they have their contracting offices set up by centers of excellence. I've got one janitorial firm that I work with. 
um, and they are doing work at a small Department of Homeland Security facility in central Pennsylvania. Can't name names because of the security implications, but um, the contract that, that they won came out of Dallas, Texas, because that's where for facilities management, facilities maintenance within Department of Homeland Security, all of those contracts come out of that facility, that contracting office in Dallas, Texas. All the contracts for all of the DHS uh, facilities, at least within that part of DHS, around the country. That's where the contracts come from. So you need to be able to figure all that out. Because from a relationship standpoint, you know, where do you need to be going to? That's another reason that companies don't really get into this is because there is a level of investment there in developing these relationships. Some of it may be done over the phone and via email and, and that, but there may, depending on what it is that you're selling, there may be some FaceTime required. So do you want to be traveling down to Dallas once or twice a year? Or to San Diego if you're looking to do business with the Navy? Because the Navy has a big contracting shop in San Diego. You know, or do you want to be, you know, keep it more local? By going through the federal procurement data system, you can prioritize your sales targets. You based, again, it's based on whatever criteria you need for your company. You can prioritize by the size of the contract. You know, if there are certain size contracts that are a good fit for you, something that's not too large, not too small. You can prioritize by, uh, you know, the, the type of project it is. You, know, you can prioritize by the, the way that the contract was awarded. You know, what type of program did they use? Did they use a particular small business program? Did they use GSA schedules? You, know, you can look at all of that and figure out which are the best sales targets for you and get it down to the contracting office level. You can see the dates of the contracts in there so that you know this, is, you know, this contracting office buys these particular products on a regular basis. Every two months they're putting in an order for these products. So you know how regularly it is so that you know when you might be able to fit into that cycle. If it's more of a services contract, you can see when, when that contract is going to expire. If that contracting office awarded a contract in March that's a five-year deal, why do you want to be knocking on the door of that particular office? Because someone's already doing the work. You know, unless they really do something to mess it up, you know, where the contract would be taken away from them, it's their contract likely for the next five years. You know, that contracting office is going to be lower on your priority list. But you might see another contracting office where the contract is expiring next year. That's going to move up on your list because they're going to need someone to provide those services more than likely once that contract expires. You want to be able to get out and start marketing to them now so that you can develop that relationship, let them know who you are so that you can be considered for that opportunity. So the Federal Procurement Data System is really the place to start. There's a companion site to that, um, usaspending.gov. Some businesses find that USA Spending is more user friendly. Um, because of my background as a consultant, I was always told to go as close to the source data as possible. Um, that's just how I've, uh, how I've worked. And I've actually been using the Federal Procurement Data System for about 15 years or so, because that is the source data. You know, the, the contracting officers, when they award a contract, modify it, obligate dollars to a contract, whatever they do, um, anytime they take an action against a contract, they put that information into the federal procurement data system. So that is the source data. Uh, the, the federal procurement data system is the source data. That's where contracting officers, whenever they take an action on a contract, award it, modify it, uh, obligate dollars towards it, they input that data into the Federal Procurement Data System. FBDS, FPDS, yes. So questions on FPDS. If you need help navigating that system, please let me know. Um, you know we can either set up uh, you know, a webinar type format for me to um, web conference kind of thing to be able to demonstrate it to you online. If you want to come down to our office in King of Prussia, we do have some training facilities there that, um, that we can use and I can walk you through the whole process. FedBizOps is the other site that's here. How many of you have heard of FedBizOps? 
a couple of you. FedBizOps, uh, any solicitation 25,000 and up has to be posted on FedBizOps. And there are a lot of companies out there who think that the federal procurement, um, the, the way that you do business with the federal government is you register in SAM, you get solicitation from FedBizOps, and you submit your bids. And that's what the process is. There's a lot of companies that do that. There's a company that I met um, probably about six months ago now. That's what they believed the process was. Over the, a two-year period, they had submitted about 200 proposals for federal opportunities. They won five. Because all they were doing was waiting for something to come out on FedBizOps that looked like it might be close to what they can do, trying to submit a proposal and hope they would win. If they had done a little bit more digging in the federal procurement data system, developed the relationships with the contracting offices, you know, gone out, you know, done, uh, gotten some face time, gotten some information in front of them, had some of those conversations, likely there would have been a lot of those 200 that they submitted uh, proposals for that they would have decided not worth the time and effort. You know, because it's too complicated, it's too, you know, too whatever. I'm going to make a no-bid decision on that. Because by having that relationship, you get a little bit more understanding of what the requirement is. So, but FedBizOps is still an important part of the process. You can't just ignore it because that's where the documentation comes out. So the, there's a few benefits to being registered on FedBizOps. When you do a search, you can save the search and have the results emailed to you on a regular basis. It saves you from having to go in every day and seeing what, what else is out there. Second thing is that uh, you can add your name to the interested vendors list so that um, it lets other companies know that you're interested, but more importantly, lets the contracting officer know that you're interested in that opportunity. If they're gonna have a pre-bid meeting or some sort of walkthrough, depending on the, the, what the requirement is, likely they're only going to invite the companies that are on the interested vendors list. You know, they're not going to just open it up to the world to show up. They need to plan for it, and so they will invite the companies that have said, yes, we're interested in that opportunity. And the third benefit to registering is that you can add a, a solicitation to what the system calls your watch list. Those are for the opportunities where you are planning to submit a bid. You're pulling all the paperwork together. If, if you're planning to submit that bid, include the solicitation on your watch list so that if there are any changes to the solicitation, the system emails you to say, hey, there's something new. You know, it could be something as simple as they're pushing back the, the due date. It could be that there's a modification that they're releasing. It could be that they're canceling the solicitation. You know, I've worked with companies that have spent days and weeks and months putting solicitations together, only to find out you know, that they go back three days before it's due, find out that there were five modifications that were issued since they last looked. And guess what? In three days, they didn't have time to go back and rework their proposal. You want to be able to have the latest and greatest information. So, questions on this? when there's a particular solicitation uh, requirement that you're looking to, to submit a bid on. Um, there, there's a button on there that says, add this to your watch list. You want to click that button, and therefore, whenever there's any changes, whenever that, that particular solicit solicitation changes, it will, the system will send you an email to say, this is something that, um, you know, there's something new out here. It'll give you a link to go to, to the FedBizOps site so that you can get the latest information. So, anything else? Mm-hmm. 
that that's just part of, that's why you you want to be able to go back and review the FAR and review those sections of the FAR to understand what, you know why did the contracting officer put those clauses in there because that when you're filling out a federal solicitation for the most part it's just fill in the blank you know the federal government says this is what we're looking to buy and this is the information that we need from you to make sure that you can do the work um, whether it's you know part of it is your pricing part of it might be the people you know, and they want to see some resumes that you just put into a particular section. Part of it might be a quality assurance plan, you know, that you put into a particular section. Um, but a lot of it's really just fill in the blank. Um, so, you know, being able to, to understand the FAR and the clauses and why those things are in there, that, that's why you want to be able to review the FAR, to know that this is what a contracting officer is looking for. This is why that, you know, this, they put this particular clause in the contract. So... Um, because at the end of the day, once you sign that proposal and you submit it, when the, the contracting officer gets, you know, however many proposals it is, the company that wins the contract, the contracting officer signs their proposal. You know, and that becomes the contract. So that's why the solicitations can sometimes be a little bit daunting, um, because the, you know, the solicitation actually becomes your contract in the end. So let's move on to subcontracting. Whenever a large business wins a contract $650,000 or above or $1.5 million or above in construction, that, uh, that large business has to put a subcontracting plan as part of their proposal. They need to include it. And they are going to show how they're making opportunities available to the different types of small businesses. They're going to negotiate the percentages based on who they know. Contracting officer is going to start with a 23, 5, 5, 3, and 3, just like the federal agencies have. But, you know, uh, for each project, if there's a large business that uh, knows of a really good hub zone firm, you know, and instead of just giving 3% of that contract to, to hub zone businesses, they may say, I'm going to give 7%. But because I'm giving 7% to hub zone, I really don't know small disadvantaged businesses that can work on this. So uh, instead of 5% there, how about if I scale that back to 1%? So they negotiate it. It's about relationships. So you, know, you need to, again, be developing the relationships with the, the businesses that are winning the contracts. The SBA puts out a tool, Directory of Large Primes, that lists the, the companies um, because we audit those subcontracting plans. It's part of the function of the SBA. So as we audit them, we have the points of contact. We list them there. That particular system is organized by state, and within each state, the companies are listed in alphabetical order. So if you know the companies that you want to work with and you know where they're based, that can be a really good tool to be able to find a particular point of contact to begin reaching out to for subcontracting opportunities. With subcontracting, that can be a good way to get your foot in the door with federal, uh, federal contracting because the opportunities are typically going to be a little bit smaller and it's less risk. You know, it's risk and reward. Prime contracting, higher reward, but it's higher risk because it's your contract. Subcontracting, lower reward, you're getting just a small piece of the contract, but lower risk because it's not your contract. So, depends on where your, your risk and reward level uh, will fall. Um, but you can use the directory of large primes to, you know, if you know where the companies are based, um, if you don't know the companies that you want to work with, use a combination of SAM and the Federal Procurement Data System. Because the Federal Procurement Data System identifies the, the companies that have won the contracts in the past. So you know who's winning the contracts, how many they've won, how many did they win last year, the year before that. You know, how strong is their relationship with that contracting office? And then SAM lists the points of contact. So, you know, it may not be the particular point of contact that you need for subcontracting, but there's going to be a government business point of contact that you can reach out to and begin networking to, to get into and talk to the right person for subcontracting opportunities. And then the SBA also puts out Subnet, um, which is a tool that large businesses can use to post opportunities they're when they're looking for small business partners. That is not a requirement. And typically, it's for the companies that have trouble meeting their small business goals. 
the, they're the ones that are going to use it more than, than others. But again, the, the biggest, uh, the, the field that you want to look at most closely in subnet is the, the point of contact. You know, for the, the companies that are posted there, you know, that this is the person that I need to reach out to. You're trying to develop that relationship because even the large primes need to know that you can get the job done for them. You know, that, that is their first criteria as well. The fact that you've got a certification, that you fall into one of these small business categories, hey, that's great. But again, if you can't get the job done, they're going to find someone else to, to do it, whether it's a large business or small business or someone else. So questions on subcontracting? Who's heard of GSA schedules? We got one. GSA schedules are contracts that you negotiate with the General Services Administration. The GSA is a federal agency, and primarily what they do is buy stuff for other federal agencies. They award these contracts that any federal agency can use. The GSA schedule contracts, what you're really negotiating is a schedule of your pricing. It's for products and services that are commodities you know, or commodity-based. So if you've got a commercial off-the-shelf product, if you have a packaged service, if you have a labor hour, those are really the three, uh, three types of commodities that, the, that go on to GSA schedule. It's not for everyone. Uh, but as you begin to, to do some of the research, if your customers, you know, the agencies and those contracting offices that you want to do business with, if they use GSA schedules to buy your products and services, you may need to consider getting on. If they don't use GSA schedules, why waste the time and effort? Do that research up front. Because the federal procurement data system can tell you are the, is that contracting office using GSA schedules to buy your particular products and services? The reason that some agencies don't use it is because as you go through the nego uh, negotiating process with GSA, you, you submit a proposal to them, and it's going to be based on your best commercial pricing. GSA requires a discount off of that best commercial price. Still want you to be profitable because you need to make a profit. If you're not profitable, you go out of business and then the, that agency loses a good customer or a good, uh, good vendor. Um, you know, none of us want that to happen. But GSA requires a discount off of your best commercial price because in their mind, every federal agency uses the, the GSA schedules. And so the federal government will be your biggest customer. And because they're your biggest customer, they want your biggest volume discount. That's the, the rationale behind it. Once you negotiate that volume discount, you will then add three quarters of 1% to every line item. GSA calls it an industrial funding fee. It's really a contract management fee because the part of GSA that oversees the schedule contracts, they don't get appropriated funds from Congress. That's how they operate, is from those fees. Because of that three quarters of 1%, there's some agencies out there that say, you know what? I can negotiate just as well as GSA. Why should I go through GSA and have to pay them an extra three quarters of 1% to use their contracts when I can negotiate the same, you know, we're very close to the same pricing, maybe even customize it a little bit so I'm not just getting some standard commercial off the shelf type product or service, but I can get something that I really need, um, you know, and, you know, and save myself a little bit of, of money in the process instead of having to pay GSA this three quarters of 1% particularly in the budget environment that we're in right now with the sequester and, you know, every agency is having their budgets cut back. Any little bit that they can save, that's what they're trying to do. But depending on the volume discount that's there, it may make more sense for the agency to use GSA schedules. Depends on what you're trying to sell and how that agency wants to buy. Do the research up front. The information is out there. If you want to become a GSA schedule contractor, really it's just a matter of submitting the proposal to GSA, doing the negotiating. From my contacts at GSA, it takes about a year for the contract to be put in place. So, but one of the things that GSA requires, because that's how they get funded, there are uh, um, minimum, uh, you know, minimum revenues that you have to get off of that contract in order for them to automatically pick up the options. 
the first two years, you have to do at least $12,500 worth of business per year in order for them to automatically pick up the option on that contract. Every year after that, it's $25,000. If you don't hit those numbers, then the GSA could just terminate the contract or not pick up the option on the contract because they're not getting the revenue from it. You know, think of it like a, a retail shop where there's some product that's sitting on the shelf that, you know, that needs to be moving on a fairly regular basis. If it's not moving, that retailer is likely going to say, okay, let's get rid of this, put something else up there that, you know, that we can sell. Because if something's just sitting take, uh, and taking up shelf space, they're not getting any revenue from it, they're not going to continue offering it. And that's how GSA approaches this. So questions on GSA schedules? You negotiate it with GSA. Um, it's based on your commercial pricing. So as part of the proposal, you're submitting your commercial invoices. So if you've given a particular customer a, a volume discount, you know, let's say it's you know, 5%, GSA wants more of a discount off of that. How much more is how much you negotiate with them? company that I used to work for, we had a GSA schedule. We were consulting from everything was labor hour based. The discount that we gave to GSA, because our prices stayed the same for all of our commercial clients. We didn't give anyone any sort of discount. So the discount that we gave to GSA, because we were required to, was a dollar per hour off of every labor category. That's what we negotiated. So for some companies, it might be more than that. GSA actually wanted, I think, like $10 an hour, something like that. Um, they wanted a much larger discount, um, but because we had the, the proof that all of our labor rates were the same for every one of our customers, you know, we gave them the discount that they required. It doesn't have to be huge, but it needs to be a discount. One thing that I'll tell you about GSA schedules, once you get through the SAM registration database um, you, and you get all of your information in there, because that is a public system, there's a lot of consultants that start mining that database to, to try to find customers. So more than likely, you're going to get inundated with emails and phone calls from these companies trying to sell you their services. And most of them will be telling you that you, know, you have to get on GSA schedule. We guarantee that we'll get you on GSA schedule. You don't have to sign up with any of them. You know, that, that is absolutely, you know, um, you know the... You know, and we can have another discussion about consultants at a later time. Um, you know, but um, one thing that I would recommend as you're setting up your SAM profile, set up a separate email address just for your SAM profile. You know, government info at whatever. So that way it's an email address that you can check on a regular basis for any legitimate business opportunities. You don't, don't want to ignore them but it also keeps all of those consultants and all that spam from filling up your inbox. Can't do anything about the phone calls because the phone number has to be legitimate, but at least you can get rid of some of the, the clutter um, if you set up a separate email address. In terms of you, ha you know, the, the consultant saying you have to be on GSA schedule to do business with the federal government, federal government spends about $500 billion a year. There's between 30 and 40 billion that's spent off of GSA schedules. So it's not insignificant. You know, it's somewhere, you know, seven, eight, nine percent, you know, depending on the year. You know, something you don't necessarily want to ignore, but do your homework up front. It's not the end all be all that these consultants claim it is. Questions on GSA? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, GSA schedules have changed a lot. Um, uh, you know, the, they, uh, some of the procurements are competed, some can be direct buys. Um, you know, the, the, the regulations have changed quite a bit over the, you know, um, particularly with the, the electronic age with things moving online. They do a lot of online bidding systems. So the, the process has changed quite a bit. So, but it's still, you know, if you have a GSA schedule contract, it's still up to you to go out and do the marketing.
Joint ventures, we'll cover briefly. With a joint venture, you're pursuing an opportunity that is probably a little too big for you to handle on your own. Um, a lot of uh, joint ventures are to pursue bundled requirements. A bundled requirement is when a contracting officer takes two or more existing contracts where one of them was won by a small business, at least one of them was won by a small business, pulls them together into a single contract moving forward. You know, because of that, the, the contract is a little too big for that small business to do on their own. And so what's the, what a lot of companies would do would be to create a joint venture because there's something they just they can't handle that contract by themselves. So they're trying to combine with another company, creating a third business entity between the two of them, the joint venture entity, that pursues that opportunity. Well, under normal rules of affiliation, what happens, you create a joint venture, we add the employees and the revenues, all the companies that are involved in that joint venture, add them all up, and if you go over the size standard, the joint venture entity is not a small business. So what Congress did to be able to help everyone out was exclude those companies from affiliation so long as each company that's in that joint venture entity is small individually. What that means is that if you're going after a bundled requirement, you're the small business, um, and we have a, a landscaping company here, so that's the example that I usually use. Um, you know, there are national parks. There's a national park in Valley Forge right near our office. There's one in Independence Hall down in Center City, Philadelphia. There's one at Gettysburg. National Park Service uh, had landscaping, three landscaping contracts for all three parks. Contracting officer decides, you know what? It's all the same services. They're all pretty close. Why not just combine them into one contract? It makes my job easier. But if you're the landscaping company that was doing Valley Forge, likely you don't want to be going into downtown Philadelphia. Maybe you would, you know, but you know, getting into downtown Philadelphia is a royal pain. You certainly don't want to be going all the way out to Gettysburg because you can't afford the overtime and the transportation costs. Just too much. You know, the company that won in Gettysburg doesn't want to be doing Valley Forge and Independence Hall. The company in Independence Hall likely doesn't want to be going out to Valley Forge and doesn't want to be going to Gettysburg. You know, but that's a bundled requirement. If those companies, three companies get together and each of them is small individually, they would not be aff affiliated because they would be excluded from that because they're pursuing a bundled requirement. And if there are multiple joint, uh, small business joint ventures that are pursuing that opportunity, the contracting officer can do it as a small business set aside. So it gives some advantages to pursuing some of these larger opportunities. But the downside to that is you may need to work with competitors. You know, the reason that I use landscaping as the example is because it tends to be more geographically focused. You know, so if the opportunities are spread out a little bit, you can create that joint venture to you know, where you're not working with a direct competitor. For other opportunities, you may not be so lucky. So it is a strategy that works. There are a lot of companies that do it, but it's probably the riskiest of all the strategies. Well, the joint venture entity is going to have its own SAM registration. So, because that, that is the prime contractor. So, the other companies don't necessarily need to be registered in SAM, um, so long as the joint venture entity itself is. Um, and then, you're, you know, in most cases, you're going to be submitting the joint venture agreement to the contracting officer, and they're going to be reviewing it to make sure that you know, that company is meeting limitations on subcontracting and, you know, all the other clauses that need to be met. So. So if you do this joint venture, you are the contracting company hiring the company, then the company then Then, you know, the joint venture entity would be held liable, all, all three companies together. Um, yes, the, the, joint venture, uh, the joint venture entity would have to have its own separate bank account as part of the SAM profile. So, and what most companies do just to protect themselves is they set it up as an escrow account. So that way, depending on the percentage of ownership of all the companies within that, um, that joint venture entity, they, you know, the, the bank handles it and sp you know, spreads the money out according to the, you know, um, however the, the ownership is set up. So in that way, it just protects everyone so the money comes in. 
you know, um, you know, you're entitled to your portion of it, um, and that's all you're entitled to. And it's not like one company has control over all of that, and they take off with it, and you're left holding the bag. Um, because unfortunately, that has happened in the past. Um, likely they would withhold all of the money because it's the, you know, it's the joint venture entity together that is responsible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, the, there is some risk with this, um, you know, but it does work. You know, the, you know, one of the things with joint ventures at the federal level, it is to work on a particular project. You know, this is not something that you create just to, to sort of have it. Um, and there are some limitations to it. You can only, the joint venture entity can only win three contracts over a two-year period. So it's not the kind of thing that you can just use over and over and over and over again. So from that perspective, the, the risk is going to be limited a little bit. So anything else? Mm hmm Absolutely. So long as you are at least 51% owner and you control the joint venture entity, then it would be considered a service-disabled veteran-owned joint venture, yes. We're running a little short on time, so let's get into marketing. I've been talking a lot about it, and I've talked about the four levels that you need to reach out to. Um, going to large prime contractors is subcontracting, so I'm not going to cover that in any more detail. But getting out to the, the federal agencies, you need to reach out to the small business specialists, the program staff, the contracting staff, and whoever's overseeing the budget are really the four areas that you need to be reaching out to. So how do you do that? Well, number one, you've done your research. You know the contracting offices that you want to be reaching out to. If you have contacts within that contracting office, use them. Reach out to them. They may not be the right contact, but do you know who on, you know, on that facility I should be talking to? Do you know anyone in the, in the contracting office? Do you, you know, who do you know that I might be able to, to talk to? Use your contacts. If you don't know of a particular contact, start with the small business specialist. Every contracting office has someone assigned as a small business specialist. If you don't know who the small business specialist is, that's where this document comes into play. This comes from the website osdbu.gov. This is the listing of all of the, the headquarters offices for small business programs in all the federal agencies. Most of the people on this list do not know anything about the contracts that you want to win. They know the people that know about the contracts. I talked about Toby Hanna Army Depot a little while ago. Let's say that you've done your research and Toby Hanna is the place that you wanted to work. You decided that was just a great location, they had opportunities for you, you know, that that's really where you want to want to start getting some contracts. But you don't know anyone there. You would go to page four in this document under Department of the Army. And you see that there's an office in the Pentagon with a phone number. And the director of the office is Tracy Pinson. The deputy director is Sue Ellen Jeffress. Tracy and Sue Ellen don't know anything about the contracts coming out of Toby Hanna Army Depot. But what you would do would be to call the number that's listed there and just ask the question, who's the small business specialist to Toby Hanna? Can I get their, their name, their email address, and their phone number? And they should be able to give you the name and number for David Kern. Now, Dave is someone that I've worked with quite a bit. Dave is a great person to, to know. He has a passion for small business. He does his job very, very well. Dave is the person, you know, once you hang up the phone with the Pentagon, you're going to reach out to Dave, and you're going to call him directly. You're going to try to set up an appointment with him. 
more than likely you're going to get his voicemail because he might be meeting with other small businesses. He also has some contracting duties himself. He's got other responsibilities on the base. He might be meeting with the contracting staff because he's part of that planning process, so they might be in some meetings. He may not be sitting at his desk to take your phone call. So you're going to leave him a message. But you don't want to leave him the message, Hi, my name is Joe Smith. I'm from ABC Company. Please call me. Thanks. Bye. If that's all the, the message that you're leaving, Dave doesn't have a reason to call you back. You want to leave him a message asking very specific questions. Hi, Dave. I'm Joe Smith. I'm from ABC Company. My company provides you know, the, these particular products and services. I saw that last year your contracting office had awarded five contracts for those same types of products and services. And one of those contracts is going to be up for renewal later this year. I want to be able to sit down, talk with you a little bit about it, you know, get a better understanding of what you're looking for, see if I might be able to help you out with that. Please call me. Here's my phone number. By leaving the more detailed message for Dave, you're letting him know, number one, you've done your homework. You know that he buys what you sell. Number two, you're saying, I want to be an option for you. Because when Dave has more options, he gets a better value, more bang for his buck. That's what he's looking for. He wants to be able to go to, his, to the contracting staff and say, look, you're looking to buy this. You know, we've used the, the same three companies, just rotating between these three companies for the last five years. You know, here's someone else that might be able to do it, might be able to, to put a different spin on it, might be able to give us more value. You know, let's think about it. Let's talk about it. Let's, you know, let's see if we can consider them. Doesn't mean you're going to win the contract, but at least, you know, uh, you can be thrown into the mix. So you need to be persistent with it. Dave may not get back to you right away. I know he tries his best, but he's got a lot of other things going on. You may need to call him a few times, but you want to be able to reach out, be persistent, try to get that meeting. Because when you have that meeting, that's when he's going to be able to tell you a little bit more information about that requirement. The more information you know, the more competitive your proposal is going to be. If you're just waiting for the solicitation to come out on Fed Biz Ops, most small business procurements are only out on the street for 30 days. If you only have 30 days to understand the requirement first off, gather the resources that you need to, um, to work on the requirement, get the pricing from them to put it into your proposal, get financing if you need financing, you know, identify you know, partner companies, you're, you're trying to do everything as well as write the proposal on top of it, 30 days is not a lot of time. If you sit down and you talk with Dave, you get that understanding six months or a year out because the contract expires six months or a year from now. You have that understanding. You know, okay, I'm going to need this, that, the other thing. Let me go to the supplier. Let me go to the staffing firm, see if they can help me identify some, uh, some individuals that I might need. Let me go here, let me go there, let me go to the bank to get the financing lined up. You, know, you have more time to get everything done. When you have more time, that supplier is going to give you a better deal. Because if you go to them three weeks before the proposal is due, you tell them, I need your pricing in two weeks, and they have to jump through hoops to see if they can get you what you need, they're going to pass those costs along to you. That means your, the cost in your proposal go up. You, know, you give them six months uh, to be able to, to figure it out. Well, then they may not be jumping through as many hoops. They may even be able to give you a better deal because they can strike a deal um, you know, to, to lock in pricing now that might be lower than when you wait for the la till the last minute. Because you can get a better deal, the cost in your proposal go down. You're not going to get all of the ins and outs of the, you know, uh, all the, the little minute details of that opportunity, but you're going to have enough that you can start putting the, the whole package together. So that's why you need to be out and doing the marketing. Start with the small business specialist, and Dave can then make introductions to the program staff, to the contracting staff, whoever it is that you need to, to reach out to within that contracting office, so that uh, within that agency, so that you can make the the right connections. So questions on that? Yes. 
Now, small business specialist is a generic title that we use. Some agencies, it might be deputy for small business. Um, some, it might be, some still use the term um, OSDABU, Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization, that they go by different titles. Small business specialist is more the generic title. Um, but, you know, if you talk to Dave, that, that's what, you know, and you say small business specialist, that's what he's going to be known by. So, you have a question? Dave is a specific person at Toby Hanna Army Depot, and there's someone like him at every contracting office across the country. Dave is a specific person at Toby Hanna Army Depot. He is the small business specialist. There is someone like him at every contracting office across the country. So every contracting office has someone assigned as a small business specialist. Usually it's the small business specialists who represent the agency at the, the procurement conferences. Um, so you want to be able to get out and meet them. You know, uh, if you can get, some, you know, get them on the phone, ask them where they're going to be. That gives you a little bit of face time with them. There are some uh, procurement conferences that have business matchmaking events. Um, and the, the Meet the Buyers event that's going to be coming up later on really is a business matchmaking event. So those are the types of events that you want to be able to, to work with so that you get some time one-on-one -on -one across from that, that buyer. So questions on marketing. Does that answer your question about what's the, the process? Get into to it. One of the documents that you need to create is a capability statement. One sheet of paper for this. Keep it brief. You don't want to hand them a book because a book is just going to get lost. One sheet of paper that they can file away because when the small business specialist, you know, the, when the contracting office, uh, officer comes to them and says, hey, who do you know that might be able to do this? They want to be able to pull out those capability statements, go to the copier, run the copies very quickly. So you keep this to one sheet of paper. This is, uh, you know, some of the information that should be on there, you don't have to put everything, depending on what you do. Put on what fits, but this is a snapshot of your company, who you are and what you do. The three things that they're really looking for, what you do, that's your NAICS codes. Your list of NAICS codes tells them, this is what my company does. They want to know how well you do it. Part of that is your expertise. Part of that is the discussion that they have with you. Third thing that they look at is your certifications. How can we get a contract to you if we like you? Certifications are just an avenue for them to, to be able to award a contract to you. So th those are the first three things that they look at. What do you do? How well do you do it? How can I get a contract to you if, if I decide that I want to work with you? And your capability statement should be able to address that. So the other thing with your capability statement, make it look good. You know, this should not look like a resume. It should not be a white piece of paper with black text and some bullet points. This is a marketing document. Make it look like a marketing document. Putting your offer together, read the solicitation. I've read hundreds of them. They're not fun, but read the whole thing. Pay particular attention to the contract clauses. Get the procurement history. Understand the previous pricing. You're not going to get all the ins and outs of the pricing, but at least you'll know what the, what the award price was, the final price, so that you know if you're in the same trend. A good thing to do with that is call the contracting officer. Because when you call them to get the history, you can ask them the question, has the scope of work changed? You, know, you might be putting pricing together and you know, trying to figure out how in the world could someone get this done that cheap when the opportunity you're looking at might be a bundled requirement? Maybe they added stuff to it, added another contract, so that the pricing will be a whole lot more. So you want to be able to ask that, that question. Get to the pre-bid meetings and the walkthroughs. If you have questions, ask them. Once the solicitation is out on the street, they're not going to be able to answer questions directly unless it's something very basic. They can't give you a competitive advantage over someone else. 
but they can take your questions and then post those questions and answers you know, back on FedBizOps and one-time shot so that everyone gets the same information at the same time. Make sure that you proofread it, make sure that you get it in on time. You know, those are two things that they're looking for in terms of being responsive. Responsive means that you're giving the government everything that they want and basically you got your bid in on time. Responsible means you have the ability to get the job done. I said it several times today, that's the number one thing that a contracting officer wants to know. When they award that contract to you, they, they want to be able to be absolutely sure that the job will get done. They don't need to, to follow up and, and hound you. It doesn't mean that there aren't companies that, you know, the, you know situations happen, but you know, the, you know, as much as humanly possible, they want to know before the job starts that you're going to be able to, to get that job done. These are some of the things that they may be looking at. It may not be, be applicable in every situation, depending on what you do, but what it boils down to is can you get the job done? If they find that you are the, uh, the apparent winner of the contract, so that you've got, you're the lowest bidder or the highest evaluated proposal, but there is some measure of responsibility that they have some questions on, you can request from the SBA a certificate of competency, COC. What that means is the contracting officer comes to us and says, this company is the apparent winner. We're not sure if they can do it. You know, this is where our area of concern is. We come to you. We ask you for some information. Um, if we say that you are responsible, the contracting officer has to award you the contract. If we say that you're not responsible, the contracting officer is freed up to move to the next responsible bidder. So, but that is something that is available to you. It's based on the contract um, because it's, you know, uh, if let's say that you, you know, um, and a lot of them are based on finances. So let's say that, um, you know, contracting officer wasn't sure that you could afford the contract. You know, uh, you requested the COC from us. We went through, said, yes, you've got the working capital. You've got what it takes. You can get this contract done. Next week, there's another contract. Contracting officer says, not sure that you can get the job done. Well, because you won the contract this week, the one that you might be in line for next week, you've got all your working capital tied up now on contract number one. Do you have additional working capital for contract number two? If not, you may not be responsible for that. Not the federal government. Mm -hmm. once, you, once you start working on a contract, um, you must be working for 30 days before you can submit an invoice, at least particularly for services contracts. Um, once you submit the invoice, the, the Prompt Payment Act um, pretty much guarantees you'll be paid within 30 days. And if you're using the um, the direct deposit function by putting your banking information into SAM and all of that. For a lot of companies, you're paid within 10 to 14 days. So that's, you know, that's pretty much how, how the process will work. So you're looking about 45 days? Mm -hmm. Contracting officers typically going to want to make sure um, that you've got working capital for 60 days, um, simply because if there's, you know, any hiccups in the system, um, you know, if they can't use the direct deposit feature, the law says that they have to pay you within 30 days. If not, you can file a claim for interest. So they're going to use more of a 60-day time frame. Um, but, you know, in most cases, you'll be paid within 45. So any other questions on that? You have uh, in your handout my cheat sheet of helpful websites. Um, all of these are on there. Um, we've talked about the small business specialists and the Ozdaboos. Um, haven't talked a lot about procurement technical assistance centers. They are organizations funded in part by the Department of Defense. Um, they also help with government marketing. They help federal, state, and local level. They do some of the things that I do. They do things that I don't do. They can actually look at your bids and proposals before you submit them. As a federal employee, I'm not allowed to do that. 
Um, theory is I, you know, I can call the contracting officer who would give me information because I'm a federal employee that they couldn't give to you. If I pass that along to you, that gives you the competitive advantage. So I'm not allowed to look at bids and proposals. They can help you with that. Um, there are several of them that operate in eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, the closest one to here is David Dunn at Lehigh University. Um, so you can reach out to him. Most of his services are going to be free. Small business development centers. Um, most of the PTACs in eastern Pennsylvania are affiliated with small business development centers. We have one at Lehigh. Um, uh, the SBA also puts out uh, uh, our portal on government contracting, has a lot of information there. Um, SCORE is another one of our resource partners. Um, so that, you know, they are not directly affiliated with the SBDC, um, but they offer the same types of services. You know, what I'll tell you about the SCORE chapters in Eastern Pennsylvania overall, they don't have a lot of experience in contracting, at least the, the ones that I've been working with. Um, so a lot of the SCORE chapters will actually just send you back to me. Um, you know, if you work with small business development centers, they're going to typically send you to the PTAC side of the house. So, um, but the, there are resources out there to, to help you. And just to finish up, three things to, to really focus on with this. I mean, I've, there's been a lot of information with this. But the three things to remember, target. Target your customer. Do the research up front. Understand who's buying, how they're buying, when they're buying. All the information is out there. You can really figure out where your priorities are. Understand the rules. Read the FAR. You know, the, the sections that you need to read so that you can be proactive. Give the contracting officer the information that they need ahead of time. That way you're not just responding to, to the solicitation. And then lastly, get the job done. When you go out there, you get that contract, you get the job done right the first time, that's when they're going to want to come back and, and consider you for the next one. They can't guarantee you're going to win the next one, but at least they want you to be in the mix because they know that you're a good company to work with. And at the end of the day, that's really what they want. So that's all I have. So any other questions for me? Again, my contact information is on the first slide. Um, if you need any additional assistance moving forward, feel free to give me a call, shoot me an email. If you want to set up some time to come down to King of Prussia, I'd be happy to sit down and meet with you, go over whatever you need. Sure. Federal employees have literally dozens and dozens and, and dozens of um, health insurance, health care options to, to choose from. Um, every federal agency usually has some sort of wellness program implemented. Yeah. You, you contract out, like this Each agency it, it can do it however they want. Some may do it in-house, some may contract out, some might be a mix. You know, that's going to depend on the agency. So, I mean, the federal government buys virtually everything in some way, shape, or form. So, anything else? The, um, the Hub Zone and 8A programs, those are formal certifications. The applications are on the SBA website. Um, you know, uh, so you can, um, you can go on there, get some more information. I also teach a separate class on the certification programs. I'm actually teaching it Thursday afternoon in our office in King of Prussia, going over the Women-Owned Small Business Set-Aside Program, the Hub Zone Program, and the 8A Program in a lot more detail. So talking about eligibility, talking about the application process, and all of that. Um, you know, if you would want to, to come down for that, I know it's kind of short notice, but that's something that may be available to you as well. Um, so I, but I do teach that on a regular basis. It's uh, this Thursday. Um, the class is from 1 until 4 in our office in King of Prussia. So if you're interested in coming, just uh, if you just want to shoot me an email just so that I have it so that I have enough material prepared. The Federal Procurement Data System. That, that's the system. You can uh, search that system by NAICS code. So you can see, you know, within the, those particular NAICS codes, 
which offices, uh, which contracting offices have awarded the contracts, the size of the contracts, the, the whole deal. That says identify current mm -hmm. uh, no, it's the one above that, uh, F, the federal procurement data system, the, the past purchases. Or if um, Na North American Industrial Classification System, and it's a system that was developed by the Census Bureau, just and all it does is define industries. So actually, if you go to census.gov, scroll down to the bottom of the the home page, there's a link there for NAICS. It takes you right to the you know that's the official NAICS dictionary. You can just put in some keywords, and it'll tell you what NAICS codes may apply. Thank you.